one. Hello and welcome to the Friday webinar. We are on with Dr. Lamb. Welcome, Dr. Lamb and Arroyo. I think that, yeah, yeah, Arroyo's chilling. He's all, looks like he just woke up. <laughs> wave, Arroyo, wave. Hey, Arroyo. Well, he doesn't feel like it right now. Maybe like <laughs> oh my goodness. So if you're just joining us, um, we're doing a fabulous webinar today and we have a uh, awesome topic and we're going to cover uh, our senior citizens. I always like saying that word because it kind of rhyme. Uh, senior birds. Um, what What is a senior bird? I, I mean, because there are people... I think in, in people's minds, they have their their age ranges are all over the place for a lot of birds. And so this will be really interesting to see um, how we can kind of put them in that category and and, and where they start and, um, to do that. So um, and a reminder. So, Dr. Lamb, I'm going to uh, make I need to make you a co-host because I'm pretty certain you have a, a deck to show. Uh, right. To show. OK, yes, I have a, a PowerPoint ready. OK, there we go. So now um, I love your PowerPoints. They like hammer home the information and uh, and so well. So um, if you have a question, maybe we can get to them at the end. Um, and if you do have a question for Dr. Lamb, let's uh, make sure we use the Q&A button so we can capture the question. And um, oh yeah, so my, my friend is putting me straight here. What is uh, older birds this, but yeah, actually uh, this is, uh, we're doing a theme this month with our webinars. We're all, we're covering older birds in every, every which way, health, behavior, everything. So, um, this one is uh, going to kickstart it with, um, the, uh, the definition of, and going through, uh, some care, caring for older birds here. So Dr. Lamb, I'm going to let you take it away. Cause I'm sure you have a lot of territory to cover. So, yeah. uh, all right, here we go. Everyone buckle up for learn about senior birds. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Get this power clean up here. <laughs> all right. So, uh, as you mentioned, this month we're all about older birds, senior birds, geriatrics. Um, so, to to get right into it, you know, I think the first question that people ask when we hear the word senior or geriatric is, well, what makes a bird a senior or what makes a bird a geriatric and the first thing that people always think about is a number um and there's definitely a lot more to it than just a number we we have to recognize that a number is just that it is just a number and there may be um certain ages that are expected of a bird, um, where we start to maybe think about a bird being a senior or being considered a geriatric, but it's not the number alone that makes a bird be a senior or a geriatric. There's much more to it. Um, but I want to first focus on the number because it gives us a little bit of an idea, um, potentially, of is this bird uh, later in its life or earlier in its life? Uh, but is it truly a senior? So these numbers that I have up here are, you can see this chart, it has a few common species that we see as pets, budgies, cockatiels, blue bull macaws, African greys, green cheek conures, um, orange wing Amazon. I didn't have any cockatoos up here. I should have pulled a cockatoo one. Um, but these are lifespans that have been reported in a publication and this is based in years so if you look at the budgie publications that are out there show that budgies live between 7 to 15 years and this is scientific publications um, and then you look at the cockatiels and it says 10 to 14 years now the budgies i can kind of say okay yes i would i would agree with that that you know, typical lifespan of a budgie is going to be somewhere in that range of seven to 15 years. My personal experience, the oldest budgie that I've ever met was 13. I haven't met a 15 year old um, personally. But then when I look at the cockatiels and I read that the lifespan that's reported in publications is only 10 to 14, like that to me sounds so wrong. Um, but that is what is reported. In reality, like my personal experience that I've seen is I've seen a cockatiel as old as 33. And I have plenty of cockatiels that come into the office that are in their late 20s um, or just right about 30. Um, so when I look at that lifespan that's been reported and is in publications of 10 to 14, we have to recognize that that is 
drastically incorrect. Um, that that is based off of what has been reported elsewhere, um, but it may not necessarily be truly representative and is not truly representative of what these birds can actually live to. And then if you look at the blue and gold macaws, again, the literature that's out there says that they live somewhere between 35 to 43 years, but I have absolutely met blue and gold macaws that are in their late 50s. Um, and I can even think of one that I knew like 61 or something like that, early 60s, we'll say. Um, same thing with the African graves. Uh, I've known them in their late 50s, but the publications say they only live till about 48. Um, and then green cheek conures, they say they only live eight years in the literature, but I've known individuals up to 24. So we definitely have some things wrong out there. Um, or at least I shouldn't say wrong, they're just uh, poorly reported. Um, and so, and then if you look at the Amazon uh, parrot, the orange winged Amazon in publications, it says it lives to 39, but I know somebody who has one that is 98 years old um, or was 98 years old. So, you know, that is drastically different than what is reported out there. So if you go, looking uh, for a number to correlate it with a bird's, uh, you know, is it a senior or not a senior, um, you're not going to find really great information because we just don't have great publications yet to truly say how old some of these individuals can really live to be. Um, so, so recognize that when we say a bird is a senior, um, there may be a little bit of an age factor in there, but it is definitely not what we are using to tell how old a, a bird is. Being a senior or a geriatric is based on other things. So we're gonna get into that next. So, you know, what are those other things that make a bird a senior? Well, one thing is genetics. Um, everybody has a little bit of different genetics, um, and some individuals may age a little quicker genetically than other individuals do. Um, at the ends of our, you know, strands of DNA, there's little caps on the ends called telomeres, and those telomeres actually do play a role um, in the lifespan of an animal and those telomeres shorten over time. Um, and some individuals have longer telomeres than others. And so if you have longer telomeres at the end of your DNA, as long as there's no outstanding problems, um, you know, you may live a longer life than another individual who doesn't have as long of telomeres. So it's kind of a very basic generalization of what I could say. Now, the other thing that plays a role into making a bird older or a senior is uh, nutritional status. We know that nutrition is really important on many, many, many levels. Um, and if a bird has had poor nutrition from one form or another over years of its life, that is going to take a toll on that bird. And that bird is going to have more problems as it ages. And as that bird has more problems as it ages, um, you know, it may reach a more senior status or geriatric status quicker than a bird that was able to have good nutrition throughout its life. Arroyo, as always, is trying to interrupt and get himself into some trouble while we are doing our webinar, but he's okay for the moment. Um, all right, so the next thing is stress. Stress definitely is something that can make an animal age quicker. Um, when you have an animal that is just intermittently stressed, so like it may have one thing here or there that happened that is stressful. Okay, that's not the end of the world. Our bodies are designed and have evolved over periods of time to deal with little episodes of stress here and there and not have major damage on the body. But when you have an animal that is dealing with stress that is chronic and is just constantly being stressed over and over and over, and, you know, what is stress, I guess, is the other thing, you know, something that uh, may be different from one individual to another. Um, but needless to say, if a bird is chronically having these stresses over and over and over, it is going to add up over time, and that can cause damage to the body in various ways. It's certainly much more um, well understood, I think, in humans, where in humans, there's lots of data to support how stress can lead to chronic inflammatory states, and those chronic inflammatory states can lead to certain diseases and disorders. Um, 
we may not have it as well documented in some of our animals and you know may not be as well documented in birds specifically but it really likely is very similar um, that stress repeatedly over long periods of time are going to lead to damage that may make an animal age quicker than it would have normally um, the other thing is exercise, you know, how much is an animal exercising, how much is an, 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 an animal is getting around, um, you know, a lot of our birds lead a little bit of a sedentary lifestyle compared to what they would be in the wild. And that little bit more sedentary lifestyle, though it may seem luxurious to us to, you know, be able to lounge around and do whatever you want, um, it may take its toll as well because the bird isn't working out its muscles, its joints, it's not getting as much um, cardiovascular workout um, that's really important for maintaining health. I put this picture up here of this cute little bird. Um, this is a bird that I recently adopted. It's a Port Lincoln parrot um, and she has some chronic disease uh, that makes it so that she actually is a little handicapped and isn't able to um, perch like normal. You can see in the picture she's sort of like sitting on her little bottom um, and that's kind of how she lives. Um, but that means she's not getting as much exercise as an other individual that is the same age, same sex, uh, same species as her. And so she probably is going to age a little quicker um, than an individual who's again same species same sex same number age um as her then you know so she's she's likely to be considered a senior earlier in uh age uh than another individual um like her so so all that being said what is the actual definition of a senior or a geriatric well it's one, one of the definitions that um, I have heard of is it's the age at which medical conditions associated with aging have been reported uh, or are being reported. So once a bird is starting to have some disorders that are seen more in animals of an older age, that's maybe when we're going to start considering them to be a senior or considering them to be a geriatric. So what are some of those common disorders that we see as animals get older? Let me get this step a step. Hey, from a royal. One of the interns left her stuff out, so I need to hide it. Um, so a royal doesn't chew up this important, expensive stethoscope. Um, so what are the common problems that we can see with a bird as they age that will cause them to be geriatric. Uh, I have a list of several ones here. Um, and and these, these disorders and, and diseases that we're going to talk about um, sometimes can happen earlier in life, and we still may not necessarily consider the bird a senior or a geriatric. So one of the things I want people to take away from this talk today is that the definition of a bird being a senior or a geriatric is going to be different from one individual to the next. There is not a hard and fast rule. And so trying to find a hard and fast like rule um, for your individual bird is really going to not be possible. It's a little bit nebulous. We have to take multiple uh, things into to consideration. So, but these are some of the common problems that we see as birds age, cardiac disease, liver disease, arthritis, cataracts, uh, bumblefoot, and also lipid deposits on the corneal surface. So we'll get into all of those. Um, okay, so when it comes to cardiac disease, uh, atherosclerosis is the most common cardiac disorder that we see in birds. Now, there's plenty of other cardiac disorders we can see um, uh, like valvular changes, we can see um, uh, like lesions between uh, chambers of the heart where there's like um, what's called a ventricular septal defect where they have a defect in the wall so that blood is like not flowing through the chambers the way that it's supposed to. Um, there certainly are other disorders of the cardiovascular system than just atherosclerosis. It's just that atherosclerosis is the most common one that we will see in birds, um, particularly in birds as they age. And it has been, there's been studies that have looked back to say like, um, 
who, what is the signalment that we will say? Signalment means like the species, the sex, the age, um, the reproductive status, that sort of thing. Um, what is the signalment for the individual that is going to be a likely candidate for the development of atherosclerosis? And when we look at that signalment, we find that it's usually birds in their 20s to 30s um, that are more likely to be found with atherosclerosis, but we can see it in younger individuals. Um, in chickens, it's been reported as young as a year of age, um, and then we can certainly see it in older individuals as well. There's lots of different things that have been associated with it. There's many possible causes, high fat diet, um, high caloric intake in the diet, a lack of exercise, some things we already discussed, nutrition and exercise, um, hormonal drive. If you have an individual who is very hormonal, um, our female species or our female um, sex is more likely to have atherosclerosis than the male sex. Um, and it may be because of more uh, hormonal drive throughout their life and how those hormones affect their lipid metabolism throughout life. There's definitely a uh, species predilection with African greys, Amazons, um, Quaker parrots, and cockatiels as like the big four that we see with um, atherosclerosis. And then there's also some theories that inflammation, chronic inflammation, uh, could be a predisposing factor to the development of atherosclerosis. And like I mentioned earlier, um, when we are uh, talking about stress and how stress that we know of in, in people can lead to certain like chronic inflammatory conditions and then chronic inflammatory conditions can cause certain diseases. You know, maybe there is something similar to that going on in birds. Um, you know, we don't, we don't know yet. Of course, there's more uh, studies that need to be done, but chronic inflammation may be one of the things that is a predisposing factor for the development of atherosclerosis. And uh, as far as diagnosing it, uh, we've talked about it in previous webinars, of course, but just for a quick synopsis of how do we uh, diagnose this particular disorder. Uh, a lot of times it's based on some imaging studies. So we're maybe doing things like radiographs to look for evidence of changes to vascular um, uh, silhouettes. So those radiographs are not perfect and, and definitely they have to be more like end stage. They have to be further along in the disease process for there to be changes on radiographs. So we can do other uh, imaging modalities like ultrasound, but there are some difficulties with ultrasound because uh, with the ultrasound, we're looking specifically at the heart and some of the great vessels that are starting to branch off the heart, but we can only see so far and we can't see all the vessels within the body with an ultrasound. So there's limitations there as well. Uh, the CT is probably going to be the thing that's really going to be our most help um, in, in the long run, because a CT scan allows us to take multiple radiographic images, compile them together, and get a three-dimensional picture. And when we give contrast, we can actually uh, give a contrast agent that is going through the vascular space and it highlights the inside of blood vessels. And with atherosclerosis, it's a hardening of the arteries so that the wall of the artery shrinks down. So you have this normally like big um, open lumen to an artery and you get these plaques that build up that cause that wall to shrink down. So now you're not getting as good of blood flow through that through that um, artery. And on a CT scan, when we're giving contrast and we're watching that contrast move um, through those vessels, we may find an area on the CT uh, in, in a vessel where it's more narrow in one part than other that can make us go, oh, this is likely an atherosclerotic lesion. I also put uh, the diag diagnostics of blood work can be done as well. Blood work is just looking at like fat levels, um, but if it's looking at other things as well, it's looking at liver function, kidney function, electrolytes, um, red cell count, white cell count. There aren't real specific changes that we find on blood work that tell us, aha, this is atherosclerosis, but we can see things like high fats that we know are a risk factor for atherosclerosis. And then as far as treatment goes for atherosclerosis specifically, we often put them on medications that are working to try and get better blood flow around the body. So isoxaprine is a medication that helps dilate blood vessels to encourage blood flow throughout the body. And then pentoxifiline is a medication that helps with uh, red blood cells 
um, membrane fluidity. So it makes red blood cells membranes a little bit more flexible, you could say, and they're able to kind of move through parts of the body or um, vessels where they are narrow easier. Um, and, you know, these are just the medications that we're using right now. These, these may change in a few years. You know, I, I don't know, uh, because as we get better at identifying this particular disease, we may also get better at finding better treatments for it. So this is for now, um, but these recommended recommendations may change in the future. And then also dietary and exercise adjustments are often recommended, but does depend on where they are in the disease when they're coming in with it. Um, because if they're in more advanced stages, uh, we don't want to cause other problems. So um, versus if they're in more early stages, then we may have a, a better chance at helping them out with some dietary and exercise adjustments. So that's the first disease. Um, okay, next disease or disorder that I wanted to talk about uh, that is a more common problem that we'll see in older age birds is uh, liver disorders. So there's a lot of different problems that can happen with the liver. It's just the most common liver disorder that we see in birds is fatty liver syndrome. Um, fatty liver syndrome is also known as hepatic lipidosis, and it is a common problem that we see in birds um, because sometimes birds are not always on the best of diets. Sometimes they're getting a little too much fat in the diet, too much calories, not enough exercise. Um, and over a period of time, that leads to problems. You can have fat that accumulates in that liver, making that liver not function as well as it's supposed to. And then I have a picture here of an, an x-ray of a bird. Um, and this line that is coming across here is actually sort of showing the edges of the liver. The edge of my liver is over here and over here. And what I'm showing with that line coming across there is it is telling me the actual size of the liver. That's not what I am interested in having you guys see. What I'm interested in having you guys see is that this actually is showing how wide that liver is. With fatty liver syndrome, because you get um, fat that builds up in that liver, it makes it a little bit more ballooned out. And so when I see this on an x-ray, though this is not the only thing I have to be worried about that can cause the liver to be enlarged or only thing that can cause this sort of appearance on a radiograph, it is something I have to consider as a possibility. Um, normally that liver should maybe extend to, if you can see my little cursor here, maybe to about over here, kind of like right by that hip um, on this side. And then also same thing about over here by the hip on this side. So it's actually quite a bit wider than what it is supposed to be. Now, again, like I mentioned, there's lots of other conditions that can cause liver disease. They can have infections. They can have liver cirrhosis, iron storage disease, cancers, or even primary cardiac disease can lead to secondary problems with the liver because you can get a backup of um, uh, like uh, fluid essentially in the liver itself and get uh, congestion of the liver. In order to diagnose uh, liver problems. One thing is running blood work on them. Blood work allows us to look at liver enzymes and a particular value called bile acids, which is sort of the most sensitive indicator of how the liver is functioning. Um, it also allows us to look at like fat levels and um, other values as well. But but um, if I see high liver enzymes or high bile acids, I'm going to be worried about liver, liver disease. And then radiographs or other imaging modalities are helpful as well. Again, as you can see in this picture here, this is a radiograph. It shows me that I've got this wide cardiohepatic silhouette. An ultrasound can be done as well, where I actually use a little ultrasound probe kind of right up against the belly um, to look at that liver and see, does the liver look abnormal in some way? Does it look bright? That could be associated with fatty liver syndrome. Or do I see any sort of nodules or things that may make me lean more towards possibilities of cancer? Uh, to truly get a diagnosis of what is going on with that liver, we need to do like a sample of the liver. And that's through either a fine needle aspirate, which is just a small needle poke into the abdomen and into the liver itself, or a full biopsy, which is where we actually take a, a chunk of the liver. Um, Fine needle aspirates are less invasive, but there's a greater potential for um, inconclusive results to come about because we're only taking just this little tiny little sample from the liver versus a biopsy. They're more invasive, um, but they give us a lot more information and we're a lot more likely to get a true diagnosis. Um, so I don't necessarily jump to a biopsy right away when I have a bird that has liver problems, but if I have a bird that has like liver problems and they're not getting better despite us doing everything uh, appropriately to treat 
something like fatty liver syndrome, you know, or adjusting the diet or making, um, putting them on medications. Um, if they're not getting any better and their liver values are consistently staying abnormal, then I'm going, you know, I really think I need to do a little bit more, delve a little deeper and see um, if there is something more going on and we might want to biopsy. And I absolutely have been surprised every every time that I do a biopsy on the liver of a bird. Um, I am often surprised by the results that I get that I go, wow, I wasn't really expecting that particular answer. So I do think they're very helpful, but they are certainly reserved more for when um, when a bird is um, not responding to treatments the way that we want them to. Um, and what are those treatments? Uh, I fed milk thistle and dandelion root as a couple of treatments that may be done uh, for a bird that is having liver problems. Um, they are good nutraceuticals that can be helpful for liver support. And then also treating whatever the underlying cause is. If we can identify an underlying cause, say we identify that we have fatty liver syndrome, well, then we may want to be getting them on a better diet. Um, if we find that we have some other liver problem, then we may need to be getting on medications or support um geared towards whatever that underlying cause is okay arthritis um so arthritis is there's a it means inflammation of the joint when we actually look at the word um as itself itis means inflammation and then like arthro is joint so arthritis those two words together um uh, means inflammation of the joint now, there's lots of different types of arthritis, but um, degenerative joint disease is the most common form of arthritis, and it's present as the joints start to get wear and tear on them. And so as animals age, you know, as, as humans age, as anybody ages, um, over a period of time of lots of use of our joints, um, you know, it, we are going to start to develop wear and tear on those joints. And the same can be said for our birds. And that wear and tear on those joints then will elicit, you know, inflammatory uh, changes. Um, and then we have arthritis. So how do we diagnose arthritis? Um, physical examinations can be pretty helpful for diagnosis of arthritis because, you know, I may be feeling along the bird and putting its its um, wings and its legs through a range of motion and really seeing, um, you know, what abilities I have to move those those joints in their typical range of motion. If I'm not able to move them in their typical range of motion the way that I should, or I feel some like tightness or the bird is acting uncomfortable as I'm putting through range of motion, um, you know, or sometimes we'll even feel like nodular developments of the bone because with, arthri with arthritis of the bones um, or at the bones, at the joint, um, over a period of time, you start to get bony remodeling. Um, and so we may have some like nodular like, like growth sort of at the joint itself. Um, I may find that all on my physical examination. But then I'm also usually recommending radiographs as well, because radiographs give me an idea of really what am I up against? Like, how bad is this arthritis? What are the bones actually doing? And also making sure that I'm not missing something else other than degenerative joint disease, because you can have infections in joints that can limit a joint's range of motion and lead to pain. And I might see some changes on the on radiographs that make me more suspicious of an infection. Um, or... The other thing um, that I might be looking for on radiographs is sometimes cancers. There are certain cancers that can affect the joints, uh, affect the bones. They're not super common, thankfully, in birds, but they do happen. Um, and so in the early stages, I might um, be suspecting, or in the early stages, it might seem like it's degenerative joint disease when it's actually something else. So radiographs can help me to know if there is something um, more going on there. Um, and then as far as treatments go for arthritis, so the first thing I put up there is NSAIDs, what that stands for, that's an acronym for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And so you may hear a doctor say, oh, I wanna put you know this patient on an NSAID. Um, and that means that we're gonna put them on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. Um, and the most common one that we use in birds is meloxicam, but there are others. It's not the only one. Um, there's robenicoxib, celecoxib, um, and, and quite a few others that are uh, out there. It's just meloxicam is the one that we have probably the most data on um, and experience with to show how uh, it works effectively for birds, what doses are uh, appropriate for certain species, um, and all that information. Then the way that those work is 
they reduce the inflammation in the joints, right? So it says it is right in the name, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or anti-inflammatories. Um, and since arthritis, just looking at the name itself, it's an itis, it's inflammation, we want to put them on the anti-inflammatories that help get that inflammation down. You can also have them on glucosamine and chondroitin. Glucosamine and chondroitin are two other nutraceuticals that are helpful for joints. Um, they are actually components of normal like joint structure and fluid. Um, and so we can supplement those in the diet and they do seem to be helpful for some individuals. There's certainly some individuals where they don't seem to be too helpful for, but there's many who they do seem to be helpful for. Um, omega-3 fatty acids are really helpful as well. What omega-3 fatty acids are doing is they are also actually reducing inflammation. Um, they work through different mechanisms uh, to cause uh, a reduction in inflammation. They take time to build up in the body. So your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, those are going to start working pretty quickly um, to reduce inflammation and making a bird feel more comfortable. But the omega-3 fatty acids those take a while to build up in the blood. And once they build up in the blood and become effective, um, they will have a longer term effect at reducing inflammation. They're a little safer than being on non sterile anti-inflammatories longer term. So a lot of times I will start a bird, when I first identify arthritis in a bird, I will start them on non sterile anti-inflammatories and omega-3 fatty acids at the same time with the goal of maybe taking them off of those non sterile anti-inflammatories at, you know, later on um, at some point that's dependent upon the individual individual bird and keeping them on the omega-3 fatty acids to reduce inflammation over a longer period of time. Not to say that I won't add those NSAIDs back in at some point later on for arthritis. That absolutely does happen, but it's going to be dependent on the bird. And the less medications that I can use, the better. Um, so we're avoiding certain side effects. Um, and so, you know, if I, if I can help them stay comfortable on omega-3 fatty acids, that's what I'd like to do. Uh, turmeric is another uh, thing that helps reduce inflammation, laser therapy, and also acupuncture. So you can see all these medications or nutraceuticals or therapeutics that we're doing are really geared towards reducing inflammation. And in this picture here, what's going on is you're actually seeing um, a bird that is having laser therapy on its foot um, that is helping with arthritic uh, changes in, in the digits. Um, acupuncture can be really helpful as well. I personally am not uh, acupuncture trained, but I do have uh, colleagues who are um, that I refer people to um, and also have used for, for my own pets as well. So I do think it's quite helpful. All right, the next older age disease that we see um, is cataracts. And so what are cataracts? Cataracts are opacities in the lens. And so when you're looking at an eye, um, we have, let me actually go back to where I have another picture of an eyeball. Let's go to, oh, let's go to this picture here of this bird. So when we're looking at this bird, here's our eye, right? And so the corneal surface is just a transparent covering over the eye surface. That's the cornea. Deep to the cornea, we have the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. And then behind that, is where the lens lies. And so we often will say that's the pupil and it is the pupil, the pupil's just the opening though. And so you may have your pupil dilated or constricted, but that's just the opening um, uh, to like the back of the eye um, associated with the iris. What's right behind there is the actual lens. The lens stays right in that little spot. So that little black area that we're seeing there, the lens is right there and the lens is transmitting light to the back of the eye where it's hitting the retina that's all the way at the back of the eye that we cannot see in this picture. Um, that then is uh, where the nerves are lying and sends that nerve signal to the brain and then you actually see things. So a cataract happens when that lens, where that black part is, when that lens becomes opaque. So let's go back to this photo here. Um, so they can be a complete cataract, which means the whole lens is whited out. So when you look at that eye, you'll still see the iris. Iris will still be there. The color to the iris is there, but deep to it, it's where the pupil is, um, that black part is no longer black, it's just completely white. Or they can be incipient. Incipient means they're just taking up less than 10% of the um, 
the lens surface uh, or the lens uh, whole structure. Um, and so that may just be like, okay, well, I see a little bit of opacity. So this white spot in this little region of the, the lens, but it's not uh, uh, occupying the entire lens. Or they can be somewhere in between there. So they can be incipient, meaning they're less than 10%. They can be complete, meaning they're taking up the you know 100%, or they're somewhere in between. And they may progress over time, where they start off as this incipient cataract, but then over time it progresses to be a complete cataract. These are diagnosed based on our physical examination. Um, and so we are, you know, looking at those eyes, we're looking at the lens, and we're able to say, you know, yes, there's cataract there, or no, there's not. And um, I have had lots of people come in before and say, hey, my bird has cataracts, when they actually are not cataracts, and what they're seeing is some other opacity at an other portion of the, the eye structure, like the surface of the eye, um, or in the anterior chamber, which is the space between the cornea and the lens itself. Um, or sometimes there's seeing like a bluish color to the lens and that is actually something different that's lenticular sclerosis which is a normal aging um, process that happens with the lens and it's where the lens gets a little harder um, but the reason we don't call it a cataract just because it's not a cataract and how I can tell that on a physical exam is when I use my little um, scope to look at the back of the eye um, if I can still see the retina then it is not a cataract. If I can't see the retina because this white opacity is blocking my ability to see the retina, that means that that is a cataract. So that's how we tell the difference. Um, and I just say that because I've had lots of owners come in and say, my bird has cataracts when it's not cataracts, it's either uh, opacity is on the cornea itself or it is lenticular sclerosis, which is another aging change. And um, the way that I was taught it in vet school, lenticular sclerosis is what causes people as they age to need reading glasses. And so uh, when I see that change in a bird, I always let people know, well, your bird is at the age where it needs reading glasses, but since it's not reading anything, I will not give you a, a, a prescription for eyeglasses today for your bird. So, um, you know, something we don't, we, we laugh about, but uh, don't worry too much about for them. Um, now, what do we do when we have a bird that actually has cataracts? Um, you know, there's a few different things that we can do. One thing, honestly, and, and probably what most people often do is just monitor them. Um, if they have it in just one eye, as long as they've got another eye that's functional, they can still see, yes, they may, uh, you know, have a little bit of adaptations that they need to get used to in their life, but they often do quite well. Um, and just monitoring is often okay. Um, you can, for those individuals who have bilateral cataracts or are having problems, you might need to make a little bit of cage adjustments for birds. So you might need to uh, move toys around or move food and water dishes in areas that are easier to get to, or, um, you know, you may need to um, set things up ever so slightly differently that make it easier for the bird to navigate its cage. But I, I have to say, I've often been quite surprised. I, I personally have a bird that is blind, not, not with cataracts, uh, but is blind. And man, he gets around that cage just fine. Nobody even knows that he's blind when I have you know friends or family come over um, until they look really close and go, oh, his eyes don't look quite right. Um, because the way that he gets around that cage, he knows where everything is. And so sometimes it's more a function of just don't change things too much for them or change things a, a little bit, but not to the point where it stresses them. Because um, sometimes a little bit of adjustment of the environment is enrichment. It can make them go, oh, something is different over here. Let me explore this thing. So um, don't be too rigid in not moving anything around. Um, but, you know, be mindful of what's stressful for your bird. So that, that's going to be very much an individual um, thing that people are going to have to, to determine for their bird. Um, and then the last thing that people can do with cataracts is they can do a surgical procedure called a phacoemulsification. And that's what this picture is here. Um, this is uh, one of my colleagues. This is Dr. Zoe Reed. She's an ophthalmologist. So all she does is eyeballs all day long. Um, and she is actually doing a uh, surgical procedure called a phacoemulsification, um, where she's actually removing cataracts from this Amazon parrot's eyes. Um, and it's a very delicate procedure. You can see she actually is having to use um, a microscope uh, that's a very specialized microscope, very specialized instruments that she's using to do this particular procedure. Um, uh, really, really cool procedure, but definitely something that an ophthalmologist alone is going to do.
Um, and it was for this little individual here who uh, had cataracts in both of her eyes. Um, and she didn't seem to be adapting as, as well as maybe uh, her owners would have liked. So they decided to proceed with this uh, surgery and she's doing great. Um, so it is possible to do cataract surgery on birds. Um, so I just want everybody to, to know that that is something that's, that, that can be done. Okay, another common thing that we see in birds of older age is uh, bumblefoot. And what is bumblefoot? Well, the other name is pododermatitis. So as we talked about earlier, the word itis after something means inflammation. And so uh, podo means feet, derm means skin. So inflammation of the skin of the foot is what that scientific word actually means. Um, so you may hear it called that scientific name, pododermatitis, or you may hear it called bumblefoot. Uh, bumblefoot's kind of the more uh, common thing that people will say. It's kind of fun to say, um, but you may hear it either way. But it's the exact same thing. And so again, it's inflammation of the feet. Um, and you can see in this picture here of this bird, um, it has uh, some swelling and inflammation and even ulceration on the surface of that foot. And there's different grades of bumblefoot. Uh, they're graded one through seven um, with higher grades, meaning worsening of the severity. And as it progresses, it can, it starts just off on the skin, but then it starts to affect uh, underneath the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, can affect the muscles, the tendons, and even get to the bone. So it can become um, quite problematic if it, if it is allowed to progress. There are several causes for it. One is obesity. So sometimes birds that are just overweight, they're putting more pressure on those feet. Um, and you know, birds are standing on their feet all day long for the most part. And so um, that can lead to some pressure on those feet that's excessive if we're if we're too heavy for the standard body type. Um, and that can be a precipitating factor for the development of this problem. Uh, hypovitaminosis A, so a reduction in vitamin A in the diet is something that has been linked to this occurring, particularly in parrots. Um, so you can see uh, we're talking about lifestyle, we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about exercise, how if you're not getting good exercise, if you're not getting good nutrition, then there are certain diseases that we see um, that can be associated with being geriatric or a senior. Other things uh, that can cause bumblefoot trauma, sometimes they like scraped themselves on something, poked themselves on something, um, and that led to this inflammatory process starting. And then um, also inappropriate purchase. If a bird is on the same diameter perch all the time, that is going to lead to pressure on the same parts of the foot all the time, which is going to cause ulcerations, inflammation, and bubble foot. So um, one of the things that we like to tell people to do is just sort of a preventative care thing is make sure you have a variety of perches. If you've got a variety of perches of different shapes, sizes, textures, that's going to be better for your bird's foot health um, and can prevent or work to prevent bubble foot from occurring. The diagnosis of bumblefoot, again, our physical exam is often necessary. We can look at that foot bottom and go, yep, there's some inflammation going on there. But I'm often recommending radiographs as well because I want to see how bad is it. And I can often only tell how bad it is when I take an x-ray. Um, I can I can tell uh, grades up to a certain point when I'm like just looking at the foot. But if I'm really looking for that highest grade where it is damaging the bones, oftentimes I need an x-ray. As far as treating these guys, uh, surgical debridement, that's one thing that we'll do where we actually do surgeries to like debride dead necrotic tissue. Now, I will say that tends to be more for the uh, more advanced stages of bumblefoot. Um, in the more early stages, we may just need some anti-inflammatories. We may need to just adjust the perches. We may need to change the diet. Maybe they need some bandages that are on the feet to provide some support and um like a soft surface to the, the foot. Um, they may need topical antibiotics or sometimes they need systemic antibiotics. If we've got a pretty bad infection going on associated with this bumblefoot, um, because that's one of the risks is that you may have all this inflammation that initially is caused by, you know, just pressure on the foot or hypovitaminosis A, but then that breaks the surface of the skin and then bacteria that are naturally on the surface of the skin have now had had the ability to get deeper down uh, past the skin where they're not really supposed to be down into the tissues, the soft tissues, the muscle and tendon, that sort of thing, and cause more problems. And thus they end up needing to be on some antibiotics. 
uh, laser therapy can be helpful for these guys as well um, because laser therapy stimulates uh, cells to go through more of a rapid cellular division process. So it's like helping uh, areas where there's damage um, to go through more of a rapid healing. It also enhances blood flow to areas so that you're getting oxygenation to cells, but then you're also getting um, tissue debris away um, from a site um, and it reduces pain. So it's helpful on a, on a few different levels. And then um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about that's common in, in older birds um, is lipid deposits. Now, lipid deposits are these white spots that are on the surface of the eye. And so if we look at this Amazon parrot here, um, earlier we were talking about cataracts, right? And I was saying how cataracts are this white appearance to the lens. And um, I was pointing out the different structures of the eye, like the very surface structure is called the cornea. And that is where um, it's just this transparent um, surface. Um, when we have lipid deposits, it's on that corneal surface, that transparent surface, the very superficial first thing of the eyeball, uh, that you could touch. Um, that is where they get those lipid deposits. And so this Amazon parrot here, the corneal surface, which is transparent and covering the entire surface of the eye right in the center there is starting to have some white deposits. And how I can tell this um, from a cataract in a picture sometimes is a little hard to tell, but in real life, um, when I'm looking at this bird with a, a scope to actually like see the surface of the eye, I, I'm moving the bird's head a little bit around and I can tell that those white structures um, move with as I move the cornea, but they're not associated with the lens below. The lens below, again, is this black stuff that's kind of behind the pupil or behind the pupil. The lens is right behind the pupil. Um, and it's not the lens itself that is... Um, having the opacity on it. And, and again, you can't really tell that so well from this picture. Maybe this is a little bit of um, reflection from light. So try to ignore that little white structure because that is just a light reflection, ignore that. But when you look at this portion right here, you can see that little bit of white that maybe goes up to the edge of the pupil there. If I were to rotate this bird's head and look, it would kind of come over, I could probably see it over the the um, iris, the colored portion of the eye, which would tell me that, okay, it is not um, associated with the lens, it is on the corneal surface. And um, these happen because of high fat diets over a period of time. And it is seen in birds that are older age. So usually I'm not seeing these um, lipid deposits until birds are in their 20s to 30s. So I will say when I do see these, um, if this is a new bird to the home, I can tell the people, well, you're, this individual has got to be at least 20, um, if not older, um, because you usually don't see them at younger ages. I, I can think of one patient that I had that was a juvenile, but I don't think they were lipid deposits. We think they were calcium deposits. So it's a little slightly different, um, but this is something that I can use to a slight degree, not fully, but a slight degree to at least get a, a somewhat of an estimate of an age on a bird. but a very crude estimate. Um, we diagnose this by uh, doing our physical examination and um, just looking again at that corneal surface. And honestly, right now, we don't have a good treatment for them. Right now, the treatment is just monitoring. Now, the good thing is, is they seem to not really cause too much problems for the bird. Um, I mean, yes, they're going to be a little bit of a visual deficit, but you can see um, as long as the rest of the eye is unaffected, um, you can, the bird is able to see around them. It's just like right on the center there for this individual that's going to be kind of hazy. But if they kind of look up or down, around, side to side, they're going to be able to see things. They may need like to adjust their head. So you may see birds that have this move their head a little bit more um, as they are like focusing on things to get things into a better visual like uh, uh, plane for them. Um, but we don't really have good treatments for these at this time. Um, and then I just I have a photo credit down there that I just wanted to point out. I took this particular photo from uh, AAV, the Association of Avian Vets. Uh, they have lots of handouts that are for um, clients. And so any of uh, uh, any viewers out there, uh, if there is a senior bird handout, and that's what this picture came from, and actually um, has more information than what I talked about in this lecture today. And anybody can go to their 
avian vet and if their avian vet is a member of the association of avian veterinarians which many many are and we highly encourage anybody who's seen birds to be a member of the association of avian vets um they can ask their vet to you know maybe get them this handout if they would like to have this in a more detailed um a little bit more detailed handout so um i want to thank them for for uh allowing me to use this this particular photo so um now i i that is the last of my uh, PowerPoint, but I did want to also um, go over one other thing before I open it up to questions. And I had to have it out of the way because otherwise I would be being um, bothered by a royal. <laughs> um, so uh, you guys sent me some of the senior uh, Nutriberries. And so you guys actually sent me all the different sizes. I have the uh, small bird size, which is the cockatiels, the budgies, um, and the, well, any, anybody who's tiny, um, and then sort of like the medium-ish bird size, which is going to be more like, um, you know, the Amazons, the African greys, and then I also have, see how interested he is, <laughs> um, the larger birds, so like the cockatoo and the um, macaw, but the reason you guys sent me these is to just kind of show people that, yes, there are some more senior or geriatric um, products that are available for birds. And what's nice about what Lefebvre's does with these Nutriberries um, is they do have certain things that are in here that are meant to be helpful for birds with more geriatric problems. So like some of the things that are actually added in here, there's uh, dates, cranberries, and plums, and Arroyo's asking me for one, so hold on, I'll give you one in a moment. Uh, <laughs> There's dates, cranberries, and plums, which uh, are have antioxidants in them. And antioxidants are helpful because um, they can help reduce like cellular damage and inflammation. Um, and then also some stuff that's in here is there is uh, milk thistle, uh, which as we talked about for liver problems. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. Is he going for the bags? <laughs> yeah, he's going for the bags, of course. Right, come here. I, I need to give him one before I think I say anything else because he's a little too interested. All right, wait. Good job. Okay, there you go. That's awesome. Um, anyways, there's milk thistle in here, which we talked about already uh, for liver problems. And since we have a lot of older birds that have liver problems, uh, there is milk thistle in these that is supportive for the liver. Um, and then there is also uh, chondroitin in here. So like the glucosamine and chondroitin that I was talking about for arthritic problems, that's in here as well. Um, so it's actually got quite a bit of good stuff in here meant for birds that meant to kind of help with more senior or geriatric problems. However, that being said, um, it's still totally fine to give it to younger birds. And there's even a part of me that wonders how much maybe we should sometimes uh, give some of our younger birds these things as like general support things, you know, antioxidants, um, the glucosamine and chondroitin, that sort of stuff. Maybe before we actually start to see problems, uh, maybe a little bit more, uh, helpful. Uh, so, you know, Arroyo is not what I would consider geriatric or a senior uh, based on his age, based on his health status, nutrition. Um, I don't know his genetics. You know, I wish we could do some sort of genetic testing to like see those telomeres. I, I, I can't do that. And maybe even if we could, maybe, I don't know, maybe ethically I shouldn't do things like that. I don't know. But it, I, I, there's nothing about him that makes me think senior, but I'm happy for him to eat these because, um, again, they have benefits in, in many ways. So thank you for sending those to me. Uh, my birds will absolutely be enjoying them. As you can see, he already is. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in that last little bit of time that we have, I apologize. I didn't leave a huge amount of time for questions, but I'd be happy to answer uh, questions that people may have. Okay. Okay. We'll do a rapid fire one in questions here. We got one from Bonnie. Uh, when would a cockatiel be considered an adult? Um, that is like hormones and stuff like that. So that I feel a little bit more uh, comfortable where we can say that we have a little bit better definition of age. Um, and that's going to be when they reach reproductive age. So you have birds that are juveniles um, that are not 
necessarily a reproductive age and, and it's kind of like when you reach reproductive age is when you're an adult um and so for a cockatiel uh that's going to be around like a year and a half ish or so um there might be a little bit of variability um you know two years somewhere around there is when you're kind of more of an adult it's it's really hard to tell externally they don't really look all that different um but it's when they reach reproductive age Okay. And then Adrian asks if, uh, is, is anybody pursuing, uh, using hemp compounds for pain relief, um, in citizens, it has some good effects in humans and some dogs. So what about that's use with, uh, birds? Yeah, actually there is, um, a company called Elevet that has been one of the companies that has done a lot of, um, work on hemp products, particularly CBD, um, for dogs. And they actually did a study in parrots as well. Um, so yes, it is something um, that is starting to be explored in, in parrots. And maybe, you know, if we did this talk again in another couple of years, I might be adding that to the list of um, all the things that we can do. I, I mean, I, I will say I have used it in a few of my parrots that are geriatric or having inflammatory conditions and may benefit from it in, in, in other conditions. Um, so, but it is still, uh, there's still more for us to learn about it. How do you spell Elevet? That's a, it, uh, um, e L L E V E T. Okay, so two L. Okay, all right. And then Judith asks, uh, any harm in adding a little fresh turmeric uh, to their daily diet? A small amount of fresh ginger, things like that. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. When it comes to the turmeric, that one, um, we do know that it can cause elevations in liver values or liver enzymes, I should say. Um, liver enzymes when if they get too much of it. And so that's where I, I have a little bit of a hard time sometimes saying, you know, give it on a daily basis. Um, and I, I have had, um, I have had clients before who have given it on a daily basis um, that we've done blood work and they have had high liver enzymes and then we take them off and we are had the owner stop it and then we recheck blood and, and they're better. So um, I do think it has its benefits. I just don't know that it's something that we should necessarily do every single day. Um, as far as the ginger goes, um, I think actually these have ginger in them too. Uh, yes, yeah, ginger is on here. Um, that I think is a little bit safer for, for daily use. I haven't known anybody or had anyone have any um, uh, negative effects from, from uh, ginger use. So that might be something that also has some benefits for, for daily use and be safe. Okay. And then uh, Donald asks, uh, when do um, when doing cataract surgery, is an artificial lens put in or is the eye simply lensless? Like how, how does uh, it It's lensless. We don't have artificial lenses that have been made for, for birds. And, you know, when it comes to needing a, a lens, um, that's for like accommodating so that you can see close and then far. And so for for animals where we just take the, the cataract out, but don't put a lens in like birds, that means they can't really accommodate. So they're going to have to like move in closer or further back to like focus on something. Um, but you know, it's, it's, uh, they can see. So, uh, is it perfect? No, but it is better than not seeing, I guess. So is that when you're, when you're offering your hand for a step up would that kind of throw, would the, should you like compensate for that? Like a little Potentially, bit? Yeah. I'm sure with time they would like figure it out to where they would know, uh, but you might see them adjusting. Yeah. So maybe go a little bit slower. The press they're not like just, chilling. okay. And then, um, Someone asked, oh, oh, so are the, I'm sorry, uh, kind of a follow-up to that. Are the, are the uh, corneal lipid deposits ever present in older birds who are on a healthy diet? Well, yes, but I would say they've always had a history of a bad diet at some point. So they may have switched to a good diet. Now they're on a good diet. Their diet's fine, but the damage that was done was done. So that once they're there, they're not going to go, they're not going to um, go away. Okay. Uh, another question about, uh, can the cataract appear rather suddenly, like within a couple months in just one eye, or is it something else? Cause, uh, Adrian was saying that happened to their Moluccan, uh, her Moluccan hen about 30, uh, who's about age, early thirties. Yeah, sometimes they can happen rapidly. So, um, and absolutely, I would say over a couple of months, um, is certainly possible. Wow. Okay. Um, do you have any, are there any lighting concerns when you have like bird that has any kind of like cataract, like 
were there cage plays, but anything like that would that you can think of? Just curious. They have a cataract. I think yeah. that we have more concerns about lighting when um before they have a cataract, that the lighting potentially could have some effects on the development of cataracts. But once they actually have the cataract, um, because the light isn't actually getting to the back of the eye, um, I don't think there's really any um, you know, lighting adjustment that we need to do because we know that we're not they're not actually seeing anything. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Debbie asks, uh, it says that the, uh, feed their conure pellets um, and three to four sunflower seeds. Is that too much fat or vitamin A? So two-year-old conure mature, but not senior green cheek. <laughs> so so, uh, so Sorry. Are, are, are a few sunflower seeds okay? Is that too much fat in addition to the pellets? I guess, did she say how many sunflower seeds? You said a few, but what is three the definition to, three of a few? Three to four sunflower seeds. And that's per day? Um... I would assume, but I'm not, uh, let's see if we get a confirmation on that. But so she says that I feed my con your pellets and three to four sunflower seeds. Is it this too much fat or vitamin A? So it's two year old um, con your. So, um, you know, three to four isn't all that bad. And especially if you're using that as like with training, you know, so that you're like having them do things um, and exercise and uh, use up some energy while they are getting those three to four, um, that's, that's not too bad. And if you're getting the pellets, then that's where you're really getting your, your vitamin A. Um, but you may want to change it up. Maybe there's some days that they don't get any of the, the sunflower seeds and maybe they get some other type of treat that is a little lower in fat would be fine. You know, variety is, is good. I really do like variety. I think variety is important. To, and, um, so switching it up to other things might be good in other ways. Okay, and then um, uh, Lisa, Lisa Bono asks, uh, the need of the iris and the blackish spots appearing on the iris would be called what? What would you call that? Uh, if you have a thinning of the iris and blackish spots appearing. Hey, on it. Well, and Lisa's asking it. She's got grace. So uh, I'm, I'm betting I know why she's asking this. Um, because if you look on the iris, there are many African grays who have like these little black like um, dots kind of on the rim of the iris um, and what those are is those are called uveal cysts i don't know why i see them most commonly in african grays I, I occasionally see them other species too it's just like african grays are the most common species that i see them in one of my african grays has uh, them as well they're just little cysts that are there they're not doing anything they're not causing any problem they're not causing any inflammation they are just present and interesting to look at uh but not not a problem interesting okay um oh you may, we just did rapid fire Q and A's. That was awesome. Like we got through a ton of questions in a short amount of time with very informative answers on each one. So thank you. <laughs> so, awesome. so I got it. I got announced today's giveaway winner. Um, and, uh, that is going to, uh, Stacy Kinsey, uh, congratulations. You're going to get, um, senior Nutriberries, uh, as well as another La Fever product of your bird's choice. And, uh, just, you know, a senior bird, Nutriberries can be fed at any life stage, but they're especially beneficial to older birds. Correct. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. And uh, we know Roy likes him because he's just back there just yeah. Um, <laughs> that's funny. He he doesn't know they're good for him. <laughs> he probably thinks he has a treat. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, Dr. Lamb, once again, thank you. Thank you. Th oh, and Brenda uh, points out that Dr. Uh, Susan uh, Rose formulated those senior helps formulate those senior nutriberries. So that's uh, there's a lot of thought put into those those um those senior. Yeah. Yeah, when you guys sent them to me and I looked at all the stuff that was in there, I was like, man, these are just like packed full of lots of good stuff. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of good, a lot of good things. Keep your bird hopefully uh, healthy and happy for more years to come. So, um, all right. Oh, just this really quick sneak preview because we're doing this theme for senior birds this month in October. So uh, next Friday, we're going to be on with uh, uh, Lisa, Lisa Bono. She's going to do the gray way, the older gray. So we're going to be talking about uh older parrots again but we're gonna talk about when about oh, about grace when is your gray considered an older bird and, and all that good stuff so join us um join us again next friday for a continue the conversation on older pet birds older birds uh dr lamb thank you so much for these wonderful presentations and um seriously like a lot of, a lot of I, I can't believe you got through so many q a <laughs> q a answers that was like probably a record setting <laughs> honor <laughs> yeah that was awesome and oh, look who's making their, uh, I think someone's asking for a, a senior bird Nutriberry. Yeah, I'll hold them in my hand. So he's like, I see them. I'll give you, I'll do something for you. Oh, love but it. I'll annoy love you it. first. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Aurora, you enjoy, you enjoy those Nutriberries this weekend. 
Um, everyone have a great weekend. All the best to you and your flock. Until next time, everyone stay safe. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Lamb. Bye.